I am Sam Roberts of the New York Times and welcome to a video conference edition of the New York Times Close Up. Peter Baker and Susan Glasser are two of the most distinguished journalists in Washington. Peter, the chief White House correspondent for the New York Times. Susan writes the letter from Trump's Washington for the New Yorker. Together they have written an extraordinary book about an extraordinary figure. It's called The Man Who Ran Washington, The Life and Times of James A. Baker III. Baker was Ronald Reagan's White House Chief of Staff, then Treasury Secretary. For President Bush 41, he was Secretary of State and Chief of Staff. He also led the Florida vote recount that made George W. Bush president. The Times book review said, quote, when incompetence and ideology have cost the lives of some 200,000 Americans in the COVID pandemic, and when faith in American leadership in the world has plummeted, it is hard to dismiss the author's nostalgia for what Baker was able to achieve by moving the machinery of American politics. Plenty to discuss about Baker. But since we're coming off the first presidential debate and in the final weeks of a fierce campaign, and since the Times just dropped blockbuster reports about Trump's taxes, and Trump won't commit to a peaceful transfer of power, plus the incendiary battle over the Supreme Court, it would be journalistic malpractice not to talk politics first with Peter and Susan. As for the polls, the Times-Siena poll has Biden up by eight. ABC Washington Post poll has Biden up by 10. The man who ran Washington, James Baker uh, was partly responsible for that Willie Horton ad, so we can't consider him totally pure, but what would he have thought of last night's debate, uh, that debate on Wednesday night in Washington? Peter, what do you think? Oh, you know, it's interesting. I, I think he would have been appalled. I'm, I'm sure he was appalled. I think that he, look, you're right. He is a, he was a fierce partisan. He, uh, they ran the 1988 campaign against Dukakis and, uh, on, on patriotism and the flag and Willie Horton and so forth. But when it was over, he believed that government had to do something important, that it wasn't just enough to run a campaign of destruction. You had to actually use the power that you then gained through an election to accomplish something. I think that's one of the things he's very distressed about in Washington. I think he looked at the debate this week and thought this is not a discussion about issues and it wasn't even a presentation of candidates who were able to, you know, convey a vision or a, a message for the country. He would never have recommended a president go out and behave the way that President Trump did this week. Uh, his candidates, both Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, presented a much more optimistic face on America. They believed in a, in, a, in a positive vision for America. It was not about just cutting down their opponent, although obviously they were tough and ruthless on that as well. And I think that this would not have been a Jim Baker type of debate. Susan, do you think the debate changed any minds among the voters? Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much for having us. I have to say that like listening to your lead in, I want to sort of crawl back in a hole and, uh, you know, absolutely contemplate uh, what life was like in 1989 when the Berlin Wall was falling and uh, it seemed like history and democracy were uh, marching, uh, if unevenly, towards progress. <laughs> uh, look, uh, the remarkable thing about the Trump era is the uh, astonishing uh, stability of the race, given all that has happened this year, the series of interlocking crises, the 200,000 dead Americans and counting in the pandemic, the economic crisis, uh, Trump's impeachment, none of it has materially affected his standing in the polls, uh, his approval ratings, or his standing vis-a-vis -vis Joe Biden. He started out behind in the race. He's remained behind in the race. Very, very few people in America don't already have a pretty fixed opinion of Donald Trump. That being said, uh, you know, they are fighting over two things right now, a smaller and smaller number of genuinely undecided voters, and they happen to be uh, key groups of them in, in states that may well decide the electoral college outcome. So it's not irrelevant, number one. And then number two, of course, there's the issue of who actually is going to be able to vote, especially in this coronavirus pandemic. And that's where I think you see uh, a certain design behind Trump's uh, uh, flood of words, right? You know, it seems to be that he's running against the election itself, that he wants to suppress voter turnout and turn off 
as many of uh, Biden's voters and, and potential Biden voters as possible. Peter, you, as you pointed out, uh, Jim Baker was a partisan. What would he have done on the Supreme Court vote uh, coming up uh, right now? Would he have stuck with Mitch McConnell's original position uh, that he used with uh, Garland, saying too soon, uh, let the next president pick the nominee? Or would he say, hey, you know, we're going to do it while we can, and the Democrats, in effect, would have done the same thing? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know for sure, but I tend to think that he would have tried, believed in consistency. I tend to think that he would have thought that if we had done this in 2016, we can't completely flip-flop in 2020 and do the exact opposite. Remember that the principle here is not, oh, it's too close to an election, because obviously we've thrown that principle out the door. The principle being articulated here is we have the power to do it. And we have the power to, in, to put our person on the court. And when Barack Obama was there, we had the power to stop it. That would not have worked out well under Jim Baker's uh, uh, tenure because he operated at a time when Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush had Democratic Congresses. And if a Democratic Congress had not had just simply refused to accept any Republican appointee, which is the, the logic of, that's being expressed now, it means that uh, Antonin Scalia would not be on the court. William Rehnquist wouldn't have been Chief Justice. Clarence Thomas wouldn't be on the court. These are all appointees picked uh, under you know Republican presidents, uh, but approved by Democratic Senates. And the con the concept now we're now heading towards the idea that we're never going to appoint somebody on the uh, court unless both the Senate and the presidency are under the same party. That's an extraordinary thing that Baker would not have succeeded at. Well, the other thing, of course, is that uh, you know sensibility matters and the individual matters. And for example, one of Reagan's signature achievements was was to appoint Sandra Day O'Connor uh, as the first woman justice on the Supreme Court. And that was because of Jim Baker, who not only advocated for her, but conservatives were furious with this. Uh, even at that time, that was a big division within the Republican Party. But Baker saw uh, that there was still political advantage for Reagan in appealing to a broader spectrum of the American people. And that was consistently the kind of choices he recommended. Uh, and obviously, he was successful in doing so in that case. I just don't think that uh, you know Baker could imagine a political world like the one we're in now, where the goal is not just to win, but to grind your opponents into the dust uh, at all times. He lived in a world where what goes around comes around, and you want to live to fight another day. You want to live to make a deal with your adversary another day, and that just doesn't happen in Washington anymore. Well, explain to me how that someone can say, He's a conservative. I'm a conservative, says Jim Baker, even if Donald Trump is crazy. And then he says in the summer of 2019, uh, I'm not sure I can vote for this guy. And then in the fall says, well, I'm going to vote for him. I'm probably going to vote for him because what's important is the big picture. What could be a bigger picture than, than this? Well, look, I think... Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. It's a real question. It's a question we, that we struggle to understand his thinking on. And we spent five years uh, listening to Jim Baker wrestle with this very question about what it means to be a Republican in this day and age in the era of Trump. And boy, I think it's been a struggle for him. We, we spent, again, hours and hours listening to him talk through, you know, how he was, you know, disgusted by the Trump presidency and didn't find it appealing. And I think that, uh, you know, in the end, he has just, he has just, he is a parable of the modern Republican Party trying to come to terms with a leader that they don't agree with on a lot of issues. Remember, Baker is an internationalist. He's a free trader. Uh, he believes in a lot of things that Donald Trump doesn't. And yet he's the leader of the party. And it's a private moment in which people are clearly just sort of sticking to their side. And so Baker's struggling. I don't know where he's going to end up uh, in November. We'll see. The last we talked to him, he was saying, I am a Republican, even though my party has left me. Uh, and I think that it's been a difficult period for him. Well, look, that's, you know, in the end, right, uh, you have to listen to your subject. And what, what I heard helped me to understand how is it possible that uh, Trump, having done many of the things that he's done, uh, which seem unthinkable uh, to many of his critics, nonetheless, he's had a remarkably consistent uh, 40, even 45% of the American population supporting him. And I think that, you know, listening to Baker, understanding how far he and his party have traveled from uh, the 1980s and 1990s. Remember, George Bush, his best friend, the man he worked with uh, over decades, uh, this is a man who was uncomfortable even using the word I. Uh, 
Uh, he literally had a problem using the word I. And now we are in a situation where his party is led by a man who can say no other word but the word I. It's, it's an amazing transition. One of the things you also point out in the book is that what Jim Baker learned in a lifetime of wielding power was that outside, you don't have any. But as a matter of conscience, when does somebody get up and quit and stop rationalizing that it's better to be closer to the power and have some influence rather than as a matter of conscience, get up and either publicly or privately just quit and say, I've had enough. Peter? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, look, Jim Baker at this point is 90 years old. Uh, I think his idea of a compromise in this regard, his, his statement of principle is not to endorse. He has not come out and publicly endorsed Donald Trump. He has not defended him. He has not stood by him. Donald Trump wanted him to endorse him. He has refused. He has refused all efforts by this White House to engage him uh, as you know, some sort of uh, validator. He's refused to do that. And so I think that, you know, he, he does not want to stand with this White House if he can help it. But the truth is that his time has passed, and this, uh, this shows that more than anything. The time for deal-making uh, is not when you're presented with these more uh, elemental or even existential questions that the Trump era has thrust upon us. And, you know, so for us, it was not an exercise in nostalgia. Uh, but if you want to study power and how it works in Washington, you know, that's a, that's a warts and all exercise. Uh, it doesn't necessarily look pretty under the microscope. Uh, you know, look at LBJ. Uh, the question of whether you wield that power for good or ill uh, fundamentally uh, is a somewhat separate one from the question of how to do it. This book uh, was written with uh, Jim Baker's cooperation, not an authorized book. He didn't have to approve it. Uh, the Economist had a great review. It said that Jim Baker, now 90, a careful steward of his own reputation, may have mixed feelings about the result, uh, but it called the book a masterclass in political biography. Uh, the authors portray the man in full, managing to be both brisk and comprehensive. Have you heard from Jim Baker about what he thinks of the book? Well, uh, it's a good question, right? Nobody likes, I think, to see your own life put out in front of you, especially over the space of a few hundred pages. But look, he had written two memoirs of his own. So he had a chance to say what he wanted to say about his life. And I think he was anxious at this point 90 years old to have a biography out there written by uh, independent sources. He's smart and savvy enough to understand that if you're a figure in history, somebody else also has to write about you. And he was willing to take that on, even though he knew it would be, uh, as we put it, warts and all. In fact, he's already come up with a line that he's using with friends and associates. He says, I told him it could be warts and all. I just didn't meet all the warts. So he's, you know, he's already spinning, of course, the, the book. Are there things in there he won't like? Of course. Uh, I don't think it, you know, it doesn't take at face value his explanation of things. It quotes a lot of his critics. It, 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 it looks at his flaws as well as his strengths. But I think broadly speaking, he's comfortable with his story. He was Secretary of State at a time when the world transformed and he presided over the peaceful end of the Cold War. He's got a pretty good record there to stand on. I think he's willing to live with the warts uh, given everything else. Susan, you've covered the Trump administration in Washington now for uh, almost four years. Where are the wise men, or we would call them wise people today, uh, the people who we relied on. Some of those, of course, were the best and the brightest who got us into uh, the war in Vietnam and made other mistakes. But the people who you would rely on, the venerable people who you would go to for judgment, not necessarily take it, but at least rely on their experience, their expertise. Do we have people like that now? Short answer, no. Uh, slightly longer answer is that uh, Trump's rise, in fact, is a symptom and a result of uh, the collapse of uh, the credibility of institutions, the decay uh, of, of Washington. It is not uh, the place that it was uh, when Peter and I first started reporting about it uh, a long time ago. Now, uh, the truth of the matter is, in fact, that you could say uh, that Trump has confounded uh, what remained of the Washington elder statesman class and shown uh, the, that uh, their worship of power and access uh, uh, and desire to win uh, uh, was easily played upon by someone like him. Uh, look at the cravenness with which uh, so many uh, Republican senators uh, and leaders have gone from denouncing Donald Trump as a kook, a nut, a maniac, dangerous, uh, unfit for the presidency. Those are all things said 
by people like Lindsey Graham and Ted Cruz and, uh, you know, the current leadership of the Republican Party. Uh, and Trump played them. He had a pretty dead to rights read on uh, a certain category of Republican leaders. But, you know, history tells us that uh, hostile takeovers of this nature, that human nature is what it is. And, uh, you know, so I think we have to not be uh, surprised as much as we have to look at it right in the eye. And that's what Peter and I are trying to do with our journalism out of Washington these days, write it all down and, you know, look it right in the eye. Peter, uh, there are two more debates. If both of the candidates went to Jim Baker for advice on how to handle those, what do you think he would say? That's a good question. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that we, we tell a story in the book about the 1984 debate, when Ronald Reagan actually lost the first encounter with Walter Mondale, he looked kind of old, and he didn't look, uh, uh, you know, as, as on top of things. And Baker really got in a lot of trouble. Nancy Reagan was furious. She was on the warpath, wanted, uh, wanted some heads to rule. Uh, and in the end, you know, she, she had thought that her husband was overprepared. Baker knew it was the other way around. That Baker, that, that Reagan had gone up to Camp David and left the briefing books on the table and never even opened while he watched old movies. So I think that what, you know, Baker then did was he said, what we need to do is build up the candidate's confidence. This might apply to, to Biden to try to get him to, to find a way to interrupt or to, you know, counter the sort of bullying kind of nature of Trump's uh, approach to this. And Baker brought in uh, Roger Ailes, ironically, who was nicknamed Dr. Feelgood to sort of pump up Reagan. And that kind of worked. Reagan became a, you know, a, you know, a more confident, more comfortable figure in the second debate. I think Biden did okay this week. He didn't, uh, he didn't let uh, uh, Trump completely roll over him. But at the same time, he's going to have a challenge, I think, in these next debates to find a way to get his message out without uh, having it be literally uh, you know, out or, or, excuse me, out yelled uh, by his opponent. Susan, what would uh, Jim Baker advise Donald Trump? <laughs> Tone it down, man. <laughs> Get control of yourself. I mean, just on a character level, uh, I can't think of someone who's a more un-Trump. Uh, and, you know, his father, sort of a Houston aristocrat, uh, drummed into Baker uh, the need for preparation, for discipline in all things personal and professional. Uh, you know, this is a kid growing up, he would play tennis every single day after school. When he finished a match, his father would make him go back on the court uh, and keep practicing. Uh, so the, the undisciplined, uh, frantic nature of Trump's public performances is something that, that Baker would find so distasteful. But Baker did give Max a two paid up. We should tell the story. In 2016, when Trump asked Baker to come meet with him and Baker did so, he get, brought him a two page memo saying, here's what you should think about doing. And it basically said, be more presidential. And Trump basically said, not going to do it. Not my style, not the way I'm going to do things. And so I think Baker has already seen up close, you know, the, you know how much Trump listens to that. And Trump won uh, by not following that advice. So, you know, maybe there was something to it. Uh, quick last question, very quick, one word or two. How do a husband and wife spend seven years writing a book together? Well, the good news is we're still married uh, <laughs> and we're still talking to each other. So it worked out okay. <laughs> That is good news and good reviews. The Man Who Ran Washington, The Life and Times of James A. Baker III. Uh, thank you, Peter Baker and Susan Glasser for joining us. Coming up next, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment and the legacy of the suffrage movement. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. To mark the anniversary of this historic event, the staff of the New York Times wrote a book called Finish the Fight, the brave and revolutionary women who fought for the right to vote. The book tells the stories of the diverse group of women who fought for suffrage, but whose roles haven't gotten much attention. Jennifer Harlan is one of the writers of the book. She's on the special projects desk of the Times's archive storytelling team. She was involved with this book with overlooked editor Amy Padmini and culture writer Jennifer Schusler, among others. The book, Veronica Chambers. Uh, tell us, um, uh, what did you discover in writing this book, in working on this book that you didn't know before? One of the things that's so striking is the diversity of people who were involved in suffrage that many of us had never heard before. <laughs> 
Um, well, I think what we discovered was most of what's in the book. When we sat down to start working on it last fall, we the first question we asked ourselves was, what do we know about the history of women's suffrage? And the answer was really not a lot. Um, we knew some of the main highlights that you may learn in school. Um, growing up, we had heard of the Seneca Falls Convention, a few main characters, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. But beyond that, there was not really a lot that we knew about the details of how this movement happened, what was really a, a political revolution that was staged over the course of nearly a century. Um, and nearly all of the women in this book um, were figures who were very key to the fight for the vote, but who we were not familiar with before we started writing. And so it really was a, a process of discovery from the very beginning and um, discovering the, these stories that we then were so excited about that we wanted to share with, with readers. One of the things that, of course, everyone knows is Seneca Falls. The convention there was associated with the suffrage movement. But I certainly, for one, never realized the Native American history of Seneca Falls and the roots of the women's movement, if you will, in that history. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so I think there is um, normally when people talk about the history of the suffrage movement, that timeline starts in 1848 with the Seneca Falls Convention. But one of the things that we um, discovered as we were working on this book and talking to historians and other scholars is that that history really extends well before 1848, which makes sense if you think about it. It's not like at this one point, about 50 years or 75 years into the history of the country, women all of a sudden started wanting power and a voice. They had been talking about this since the very earliest days of our nation. And as you mentioned, there are many Native American communities where women had had power and a voice um, for many centuries before the United States was even an idea. Um, in particular, we talk in the book about the Haudenosaunee, Confeder Haudenosaunee Confederacy, which is located in upstate New York, where the town of Seneca Falls um, is located. In fact, it gets its name from the Seneca tribe, which is one of the members of the Confederacy. Um, and in that nation, the, uh, it is a matrilineal society and the power really rests for a lot of important political decisions with the women did long before Seneca Falls and continues to today decisions like who should be the chief, whether the chief should stay in power, if the nation should go to war. Um, and some of the women who participated in Seneca Falls were familiar with the Haudenosaunee communities, had spent time with these groups, um, and had seen it as a, a kind of model for the ways that women could have agency and political power in a society. And the Times book, Finish the Fight, also points out that there was hardly unanimity uh, in giving women the right to vote and giving Blacks the right to vote. How did they reconcile those uh, two uh, often competing agendas? Uh, well, it was it was difficult. It took a long time. Um, the suffrage movement, like all social movements, did not happen in isolation. Um, and so it was affected by many of the forces of racism, segregation, nativism, um, anti-immigrant sentiments that uh, were fairly rampant in the United States throughout much of the 19th and and early 20th centuries when the suffrage movement was really at the peak. Um, the movement came out of uh, the movement to abolish slavery. A lot of the, many of the suffragists had really gotten their, their feet wet in terms of organizing and trying to make social change in that movement. Um, and so there was some uh, cooperation between these groups early on, but um, you really get to a split when it comes to post after the Civil War, when Black men are given the right to vote and women are excluded, a lot of the suffragists were um, very frustrated that they they continued to be excluded, that there had been this expansion of voting rights, and yet women still were not given that right. Um, so you see a bit of a rift in the movement and some very pretty ugly, nasty, racist sentiments that come out in those debates, and it creates this division in the movement. You sort of have these two um, parallel uh, movements happening where there are the what we consider mainstream suffrage groups which are largely dominated by white women and then um, and in many many cases exclude uh, black women from those groups and then the black women form their own organizations and there's a very vibrant thriving black women's club movement that develops in the 19th century to fight not just for suffrage but also for um, equal rights and treatment uh, for their communities. And, and very quickly uh, the book also explains that women had the right to vote in many places before the 19th Amendment. Yes, that is correct. Um, there were many states and territories where women had um, 
in some cases, limited voting rights to municipal elections, school board elections, things like that. And in some places, full voting rights. For the first half, two thirds of the suffrage movement, it's really more focused on statewide um, battles where the suffragists thought that they could uh, achieve more tangible victories. A lot of those early victories happen in the West. So you have women in Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, who win the right to vote pretty early on in the well before 1900. Um, but it's not until 1920 with the 19th Amendment that uh, the Constitution at the federal level is amended to say that the right to vote cannot be denied on the basis of sex. Thanks to Jennifer Harlan. The book from the New York Times is called Finish the Fight. And for the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.